Bueno, ya estamos de regreso entonces para avanzar con nuestro segundo invitado eh, y continuar con las presentaciones de la, de la jornada. Continuando con la temática del agua y asumiendo, cierto, que en el futuro eh, concreto nos desafiará a la eficiencia en el uso de este vital elemento, es que quisimos abordar el tema orientado al cultivo del arándano. En este punto deseamos agradecer el aporte de Abel González, investigador de Inia Carillanca, cierto, quien hizo posible el contacto con nuestro siguiente expositor. Él es el señor David Braila. David es investigador en horticultura, perteneciente al Departamento de Agricultura de los Estados Unidos de América. Eh, su área de especialización es la fisiología de frutales menores, centrada en riego y manejo de nutrientes en berries. Posee amplia trayectoria y publicaciones científicas. Desde el 2003 a la fecha ha realizado investigaciones en varios cultivos de berries, incluido arándanos, moras, frambuesas, frutillas y arándanos. Principalmente está trabajando en, for en formas de mejorar el manejo del agua y los nutrientes de estos cultivos y actualmente está investigando prácticas como el riego por goteo pulsado, la fertilización y el enfriamiento por ev evaporación para aumentar la producción y proteger a las plantas de la sequía y el daño por calor. Hoy discutirá el uso de estaciones meteorológicas y sistemas aéreos no tripulados, drones, para evaluar las limitaciones de agua y programar el riego en arándano de acuerdo a lo que nosotros le invitamos y, y, y pedimos que abordar en el tema. Esta presentación será desarrollada en inglés y contamos con traducción simultánea que pueden activarla en la función Zoom en el botón inferior que tiene en este minuto. Eh, si alguien tiene alguna duda, va a estar eh, Enrique, ¿cierto?, eh, en nuestro soporte, eh, en el chat dando instrucciones para, para que puedan eh, optar por esa eh, opción. Eh, dejamos con ustedes entonces eh, a David Braila con su presentación titulada Manejo Hídrico en Arándanos. David, welcome to our seminar. We appreciate your willingness and considerate time to develop your interesting presentation. Eh, at the end of your presentation, we will ask three questions of the chat uh, of the connected participants. Welcome then, and we invite you to share your screen, David. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so I assume you can see my screen just fine now. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, some research we began doing about five years ago um, using uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or what's commonly called as drones to assess um, crop water lim limitations and determine irrigation requirements in blueberry and, and other crops like, like raspberry. Um, just to orient you to um, where I'm located. So I'm located in Oregon, uh, USA, um, over here um, in the Northwest part of the country. Um, in Oregon, we grow Northern highbush blueberries and, and pretty much in, in United States, Northern highbush blueberry is growing in, grown in the uh, Northern regions of the country. The most common states are Michigan, New Jersey, Oregon, and Washington. And then we grow Southern high bush in places like California, Florida, and Georgia, as well as rabbit, rabbit eye blueberries in Georgia. Um, but um, Oregon and Washington right now, we, we're the number one producers of blueberries in United States. Um, we have very good growing conditions there. So that's why we are now the number one area for growing blueberries. Michigan has the most acreage or the most area planted, but um, Oregon and Washington has the highest production. So about half of our, our fruit that we grow goes to fresh market. Um, so anything that goes to fresh has to be handpicked, just like in Chile. And if you look at the prices from uh, 2017 to 2019, we got about uh, 2.47 to 4.48 dollars uh, per kilogram uh, of fruit uh, during that period. The prices have gone up a little bit last year. Um, so we, we do pretty well with prices. And then the other half is harvested for processing. And for processing, um, we use machine harvesters. Now the advantage here is we can, we can go into a field, hand harvest the, the first uh, pick or two uh, for fresh market, and then do the remaining harvest when the berries are smaller for the process market. 
And when we use a machine, of course, we need a lot less la labor. So basically three people can harvest a quarter hectare of blueberries in an hour. Uh, but again, this has to go to process market and the prices for process is about 40% of what we get for fresh blueberries. Um, our, as I said, our plants grow very well um, in Oregon, much like they do in, in many parts of, of Chile. Um, so it takes about six to eight years for our fields to reach full maturity. So here's a 20 year old field of blue jay blueberries where you can see these plants are about two meters tall. And that's pretty much about how big they will get. Um, we'll, we'll prune them annually um, to get them to be about two meters. Um, now, in terms of water requirements, which is uh, a lot what I work on, uh, uh, irrigation is very important in Oregon. We get very little rain in late spring and summer in Oregon. So our late spring pretty much is from, from um, early March to the end of September. Um, and what we know from, from research and, and also from what growers do, that the plants require about 12 and a half to 50 millimeters of water per week. So one millimeter water is about 10,000 liters per hectare. Now it's important to uh, apply the correct amount of water to blueberries, um, because if you under irrigate, if you don't apply enough water, that's of course is gonna reduce your production. It's gonna reduce the size of the berries. Um, on the other hand, over irrigation can be a problem too. If you over irrigate, you can reduce the fruit quality. For example, we've shown that you can get, you can reduce the firmness of the berries um, if you over irrigate. And then other issues that can happen in certain cultivars is we can get what's called phytophthora root rot. So if you, if you apply too much water, you can, you can uh, uh, cause this disease to develop in the roots, which then of course will reduce production of the plants and can even kill the plants. So the question is, how do we determine irrigation water requirements in blueberries? Well, one of, option of course is to use soil moisture sensors. There are a lot of these sensors available on the market and, and, and a lot of these do work very well. But the problem with soil moisture sensors is that you can't put that many in the field um, to get information. It, it's very difficult to, uh, to equip an entire field with soil moisture sensors. And the problem here is that um, fields will be very variable in their soil type and the soil type is gonna affect the soil water content. So, so unless you have a very uniform soil in your field and you locate these soil moisture uh, sensors exactly where they're needed, um, they're not gonna necessarily be useful for irrigation scheduling. However, they are good tools to tell you, you, know, what, you know, how deeply you're irrigating and whether you're applying that water in the root zone or below the root zone. Now, blueberry roots, we know from research, are mostly concentrated in the top uh, 20 to 30 centimeters of the soil profile. Um, there's not many roots below 30 centimeters. So it's mainly the irrigation zone you're, you're concerned with is that top 30 centimeters. So another way that you can irrigate is based on the weather conditions. And um, this is what we, we try to encourage our growers to do is to irrigate uh, uh, their, their plants depending on how hot it is and, and how much rain there is and so forth. And there's a simple formula um, to, to do this calculation. However, the theory behind it is, is quite complicated. And I'll go into that a little bit. But basically what you can do is you can estimate blueberry water requirements, which is called crop evapotranspiration or crop water use, um, which is abbreviated ETC by multiplying what the potential evapotranspiration is, ETO, by a crop coefficient or blueberries. So ETO or the potential evapotranspiration, we get this information from weather stations and crop coefficients, that's based on right now theoretical values, although we're starting to develop um, actual crop coefficient values for blueberry. So in uh, the Pacific Northwest where I live, so in Oregon and Washington, we have uh, a network of weather stations that's located throughout the growing regions um, in Oregon and Washington. And with these weather stations, uh, we can get information on what's, what's the temperature every 15 minutes, we can, we can, what's the precipitation every 15 minutes, um, wind speed, solar radiation, um, and with these, with this data, 
uh, there are formulas where we can calculate potential evapotranspiration. So our growers right now, they do use these weather stations, um, which they can access via the computer. So they, they, they do this, the, they do access to get not only, you know, what were the temperatures over the past week, um, but also the program that's at these websites also provides them with estimates of crop evapotranspiration for blueberries. So as I said, the equation itself is simple, but the math behind the equation is complicated. This was developed in, in the in 1970s by scientists uh, Penman and Monteith. And basically it's a, it's a complicated equation where you take um, weather data, collect it from the weather stations, things like your net radiation, solar heat flux, air temperature, wind speed, vapor pressure deficit, and, and some constants, and you can calculate potential evapotranspiration. Now, why it's called potential evapotranspiration. So this is what a crop will potentially use, how much water they could potentially use based on the weather conditions. Um, but this model, this, this equation was developed for a, a grass surface, not for blueberries. So, or, or other crops, it was developed for grass. But what you can then do is you can adjust that potential evapotranspiration for a specific crop by multiplying it by a crop coefficient. So clearly a blueberry field at the beginning of the growing season is not gonna use as much water as a grass field. However, once the leaves are fully out and the canopy is fully developed, then it's gonna use approximately about the same amount of water as a blueberry field. So here is a theoretical curve um, that we currently use um, in our agricultural weather networks um, to calculate uh, water use in blueberries. So as you can see, the crop coefficient uh, starts slowly at, uh, at low at the beginning of the season at bud break, and then gradually increases until we reach the full uh, first blue fruit stage. And at that point, you can see the crop coefficient is one. Well, one means it's basically 100% of what the potential evapotranspiration is for a blueberry, for a, a grass field. So, so at first blue stage, the uh, water use in a blueberry field is going to be approximately equal to that of water use in a grass field. And then, of course, it'll gradually decline as the season goes along. So our goal was, okay, well, that, that's great. But not every field is is the same. I, you know the, that that curve it, it works fine if you have a perfect field um, that's that's healthy, mature, and, and 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 growing very well. However, that's not always the case. Of course, not every field is, is has a full canopy. Um, sometimes you have problems with nutrient limitations and diseases. So what we wanted to do was to increase the accuracy. So we want to develop tools where we can estimate the seasonal water requirements and, and monitor uh, crop water stress on, a, on an individual field. So basically a grower would know exactly for their field how much water they would need and whether there were any problems in terms of, of irrigation in that field. So the way we are doing this is we're using these drones, these unmanned aerial systems to capture uh, images remotely in the field and then translating those images into water use and water deficits. So initially we started out with a, a, a drone that was, was custom built called an ATI AgBot. This particular drone um, had a flight time of about 26 minutes. So basically you could fly the drone for about 20 minutes before you have to recharge the batteries. It had a top speed of, of about 60 kilometers per hour. And the altitude we fly is between 15 and 120 meters. Um, we don't like to go below 15 meters because once you start going below 15 meters, you, 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 you lose your stability in the drone. And at, um, Federal um, Flight Administration uh, limits us from exceeding 120 meters with, with these drones. Um, so we have to stay under 120 meters. But in reality, going much higher than 120 meters wouldn't uh, matter so much either because it, it's, it's beyond the, the, uh, the resolution of the cameras that we currently use to cap capture our images. Now, recently, we just bought a new drone from DJI called the DJI Matrix 300. 
this drone is you know, something that anybody could buy. Um, it, it was quite expensive. It was $25,000 US. But in this case, it has a flight time of almost an hour and can fly 80 kilometers per hour. And on both these drones, we have two types of, of cameras. We have a multispectral camera and we have an infrared uh, or thermal imaging camera. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll explain a little bit how these cameras work. So the multispectral camera, the way that works is it is measuring um, specific wavelengths that are reflecting off the canopy of the plants when we fly over the field. So our camera measures five specific wavelengths. It measures um, in the blue range, so less than 500 nanometers, the green range, about 550 nanometers, the red, which is about 675 nanometers. It does what's called a red edge, which is slightly over 700 nanometers. And finally, it, it measures the near infrared range, uh, which is around 850 nanometers. Now, if you look at this graph, um, we have plotted out here um, the reflectance from a healthy plant and from a stress plant. So for example, if you look at the, com the comparison between the healthy and the stress plant, you'll notice that at the red wavelength, a stress plant is gonna reflect more light at that wavelength than a healthy plant. On the other hand, if you look at the near infrared range, the, now the healthy plant will reflect more of light at that wavelength than the stress plant. So, so the opposite occurs uh, at the red and the near infrared with the healthy and stressed plants. Well, what you can do with that is you can take that information and you, you can, you can uh, plug them into these algorithms, into these equations to get um, numbers such as uh, uh, NDVI, which is one of the most common, commonly used algorithms called the Normalized uh, Difference Vegetation Index. So the way this works is, so NDVI takes the wavelengths that's measured at the near infrared and subtracts the, the wavelengths from the red and divides that by the sum of the, those two. So in our example of the healthy and the unhealthy plant, you can see that the healthy plant is reflecting about 50% of the near infrared that's uh, reaching the canopy of the plant and only 8% of the visible red. Now you compare that to the unhealthy plant, it's reflecting only 40% of the near infrared, um, but 30% of the visible red. So when we put that, those numbers into the equation, the healthy plant now has an NDVI of 0.72, and the unhealthy plant has an NDVI of 0.14. And what's good about these, these um, uh, ratios is that it compensates for changes in light conditions um, the slope of the field and the viewing angle of your camera. So, so this look, gives you a lot more flexibility when you could fly your drone to get this information. Um, and also allows you to compare fields to field um, quite readily. So it, it sort of it takes, it takes care of some of the error in the measurements. Now, NDVI is just one of these, these measurements we can take. Um, there are others. So here are some examples of different um, equations that we use to calculate images from our field. So on the left is just the red, green, blue composite, which is most similar to, to what we see. Um, it looks a li little more blue than what we might see, but, but um, similar. Uh, then to next um, to that is an NDVI image. So this is the case where those wavelengths, we're ju now just looking at the difference between near infrared and red divided by the sum of two. Um, we can look at things like what's called the chlorophyll um, uh, re, um, equation, um, a very equation, which is another way to look at plant health, very similar to NDVI, except in this case, it uses the green and the red wavelengths. And then on the right is an image uh, that we can get with our thermal imaging cameras. And, and th this one, that camera works a little different, and I'll explain that towards the end of the talk. Um, so what we can do is take these images uh, and, and make a composite to get a, a good idea of what's happening in, this field, in, a, in a given field. Um, so what we're trying to do then, okay, can we translate this information into water requirements? So, so how do we do that? So, uh, so here's an example of, of my technician, Scott Orr, flying the drone in a blueberry field. So basically, uh, 
there's programs that tell you exactly how to fly the drone. So we, we fly over the fields, capture the images. So the way these programs work, you, you simply go into the program and you could pull up a, 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 an image of the field from Google Earth. You draw a line around your field and then the program automatically will then calculate the flight path for the drone. So you don't have to do anything. It's, it's all automatic uh, once, once you enter in the, the, uh, the field site and what area you wanna plant, so you wanna fly. So the drone, uh, so the program will calculate how fast to fly the drone, how high to fly the drone, um, and, and whether it has enough battery life to be able to fly that entire path. So here's an example um, that we took in a, a field of blueberries. Um, in this particular field, this was a field of Duke that had some, some growth issues. Um, so we flew at an altitude. So on this, in this field, the altitude was 82 meters. The speed was 24 kilometers per hour. And the flight time was 19 and a half minutes. So this was a 10, 10 hectare field. So the program automatically calculated at what altitude and what speed it needed to fly in order to finish the flight in under 20 minutes. Um, so on the left is the red, green, blue composite, and on the right is the NDVI. Now in the red, green, blue, you can kind of see that in the center, the plants are, are a bit more vigorous, but then when you look at the NDVI, it becomes very obvious that there's a lot more vigor in the center of the field than the outside of the field. So you could use a drone, fly a field, and kind of figure out, okay, where are the problems in my field? Of course, this is an extreme example, but you might be able to find smaller regions of the field where there's a problem and try to figure out what is going on in that section of the field. Here's another example of a field. This is a Draper blueberry field that had some drainage issues. And you can, you can see from the NDVI image how basically the drainage problem goes from the upper right down to the lower left and, and increases as we move down the field. Um, so clearly there was a problem when they planted this field that they did not put enough, enough drainage um, uh, pipe in the field before they planted. So consequently the fields were, were flooded and they got a lot of phytophthora root rot in those sections of fields that aren't as green as the, as the other sections. Um, and then, um, so now we'll talk about how we get at estimating irrigation requirements. So, so here is a nice healthy field of Draper. Um, where we took an image. So here we, the altitude was at 43 minutes, um, speed was 16, I mean, 43 meters, the speed was 16 kilometers per hour, the flight time was 21 meters, and the area that we were looking at was four hectares. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the red square uh, of the field, and, and it, you, I just wanna show you how good these images are. So in this field, there was actually a harvester going uh, in the field at the time we, we did the flight. So you can see that harvester. And if we take a close up, you can see you know, quite clearly that harvester and you can see the rows of the blueberries. So, what we, so we take these images, we convert it to um, something like NDVI. And now the question is, well, what does this mean? Um, you know, how do we determine water requirements? Well, one thing we know is that um, there's a good relationship between how much canopy a plant has in other words, how much light it's intercepting at a given time and what the water use is. So now the question is, so if, if we can calculate canopy cover, we can then calculate um, the water requirements in the field. But how do we, how do we calculate canopy cover? Um, so, so here's the field. And we took images at various times over the course of the growing season. So at bud break in April, all the way to pre-senescence of the leaves in September, late September. So here is a plot of the normalized different vegetation index, the NDVI in that field over the course of the growing season. So basically from, from uh, late March to late September. And you can see uh, when the, the uh, blueberries were at their first blue stage, the NDVI was, was the highest. So it increased gradually through the season and was highest um, when we reached um, at the first blue stage. Now, of course, NDVI, you would expect to be a lot lower at the beginning of the season, but one thing that you know, we do in blueberries is we plant grass between the fields. So we're not only getting NDVI from the, the blueberry plants, but we're also getting it from the grass. So, so this is something that we're, we're working out, trying to, how to figure out 
how do we separate the blueberry plants from the grass itself? Um, but as I mentioned, there's a good relationship between NDVI and canopy cover. So Trout et al. did a study where they took actually NDVI images from sa satellite uh, for various crops and developed a relationship between that and canopy cover. So they found a very good relationship. So if we take that relationship or that equation, we can use that to calculate canopy cover. So you know, here, here's, the, here's the canopy cover, calculate it based on that equation. And as you can see now that our canopy cover is going from less than 20% at the beginning of the season to around almost 70% at first blue stage. Um, uh, you'll, now you'll notice too that after the first blue stage, the canopy cover declines a little bit. And that is not because uh, the leaves are falling off, but what happens is if you think about it, when blueberries um, fruit begin to ripen, the, can, the, the fruit themselves weigh down the branches of the plant. So that increases the area or the canopy size um, if you're looking overhead with the drone. Um, once you pick that fruit up, those canes are more upright and then consequently your canopy cover goes down a little bit. And that will actually affect water use. We've, we've looked at this in, in a number of cultivars and, and shown in every case, once you pick that fruit, canopy um, decreases because the canes are upright and the plants use less water. Um, there's also other relationships out there uh, that have been developed using what's called weighing lysimeters, where they've looked at the canopy cover or percent shaded area in relationship to the crop coefficient. So here's uh, an example uh, where they use for a grapevine lysimeter, but these relationships tend to be pretty consistent from crop to crop. So if we take this relationship now and, and use this to convert canopy cover to crop coefficients, we, we now get a relationship that looks like this. And so, so basically now our crop coefficient is going from 0.2 or 20% of what the grass field is at the beginning of the season to about 1.15 uh, once we reach the first blue stage. Now, you know, this relationship was developed for, uh, I mean, was developed using a lysimeter with wine grapes and blueberries might be somewhat different. So we are in the process now of installing lysimeters for various berry, crop, berry crops in Oregon. So here's an example of one that we recently installed for blackberries. And this summer, we're in the process of installing similar lysimeters for different cultivars of blueberries. Uh, but anyways, if you look at the a crop coefficient curve that we developed using the drone and compare that to the theoretical curve, you can see that you know, they, they do look uh, fairly similar. So basically it increases as we go from bud break to first blue and then gradually declines afterwards. So, um, so we get a good relationship here, um, just like we would expect theoretically. So now we can take weather data from these crop coefficient curves that we developed for the specific field and estimate what the water requirements are for that field. So here, doing that, uh, what we found in this field is that basically in May, the plants are using about 1.3 millimeters of water per day. June 2.9, July 4.2, August 2.9, and September 2.1. The other thing we learned from this, we can learn from this, is the maximum demand for water. So in this case, it was 5.8 millimeters per day. So when you design an irrigation system, you don't want to design it for average water use. You want to design it for maximum water use so that when the temperatures are hot and dry, you want, the plants can get enough water. So you would need to design an irrigation system that can apply 5.8 millimeters per day. And then on, uh, below those numbers, I have it at different plant spaces. So some people like to think about water requirements in terms of liters per plant. So for example, in July, if your plants are spaced 0.8 meters apart within the row and three meters apart uh, between the rows, they're gonna using about 10 uh, liters of water per plant. At, at one meter spacing, they would use about 13 meters, uh, liters, and at 1.2, they would use 15 liters. Now this particular field um, was spaced one meter by three meters. So they were using in July, 13 liters per plant. So 
the next step that we're doing now is to make this, this easy for growers. So obviously a grower is not gonna to wanna to go out there and fly a drone uh, throughout the season and get this information. But there are consultants who will do that, can gather this information, convert it to water requirements, and then download it into what's called a mobile app called Irrigation Scheduler. So what we're working on now is to basically integrate all this information into a simple um, app for your phone or your computer that directly gives you that, that information, how much water your plants need. So currently this app, we're just using the weather station data and, and the theoretical curves uh, for, for calculating um, irrigation requirements. However, um, what we wanna do now is to get site specific estimates of water requirements. Um, there's other things we can do with these drones. So for example, here's a field where you, if you look at the, the first blue stage, um, if you look at the image on the left, you don't see much, but if you look at an index called the triangular greenness index, you see some green spots. So you, you can ask yourself, well, why is it more green in those spots? Um, here is a field where we, we uh, flew it, on, flew the drone, and um, on the left is the red, green, blue composite, on the right end DI. The rows look pretty uniform, but when we look at another index called a green difference vegetation index, um, you can see that the rows, two rows on the left are a lot greener than the two rows on the right. So what we, we found was that the two rows on the left had adequate nitrogen and the two rows on the right were nitrogen deficient. So now we're thinking we can also use the, these drones to assess nitrogen requirements in the fields. So let's talk a little bit about the thermal imaging camera. So what the thermal imaging camera, this camera works a little bit different. It's, it's, it's only detecting uh, long wave infrared radiation. So it's, it's, it's the, the wavelengths are much longer than what we're detecting with the multispectral camera. Um, and it, it then will map the temperature of the field uh, based on these images. Because what happens is when canopy temperature increases, the stomates close, um, excuse me, when the stomates on the plants close, the canopy temperature increases. So when a plant is water stressed, it, it tends to close its stomates and that causes the temperature of the leaves go, to go up. And this is well known for various crops, including blueberry. Um, so what we can then do is take this thermal imaging camera, which is converting the infrared radiation into temperatures to see what the canopy temperature is. So here's an example where on the left, we have an NDVI image and on the right, we have a thermal image. Now you can see in the NDVI, there's some few rows that look a little different than the other rows. Well, when we look at the thermal imaging, we can see that those rows look quite different. And basically what the thermal imaging is telling us the, is that the plants in these rows are much warmer than those that in the other sections. So let me, let me show you an, um, uh, a close up of these fields. So on top is the NDVI, on the bottom is the thermal images. And what we found was that in this field, the, the, the plants to the far left were well watered, those that had the highest temperature were severely water stressed, and those that uh, and then uh, to the right were, were less water stressed. And what happened was, is that those rows that were severely stressed, the lines were, for whatever reason, were plugged. Um, so they, had a, they were on a different block of irrigation and those lines were plugged due to a, uh, a mistake the grower had made with their, their fertigation. So they had deposits in, in the emitters that plugged the lines. So consequently the plants weren't getting enough water. So you can detect issues like this with the thermal imaging camera. However, what we're trying to do is to detect in the entire field exactly what the water status is. So we set up a study in a blue crop field where we had different treatments where we ir either irrigated at, uh, the plants fully or for two weeks we under irrigated only applying 30% of the amount of water they would need. And then we had treatments where we applied no irrigation at all for those entire two weeks. And then we flew the, so we, we took measurements in that field. We looked at the plant water status, which is measured as a uh, what's called stem water potential or, or leaf water potential. So the more negative that value is, the more water stress the plant is. And we measure the soil water content. So on the graph on the right, you can see that 
as the soil water content declined, as we went from full irrigation to no irrigation, the water status of the plants declined too. So, so no surprise, but, but we, were, we actually were able to measure this. And then if we look at yields, we, we could also see that with no irrigation, we had significantly less yield than full irrigation and 30% irrigation. Again, no surprise. But obviously, you know, we're affecting the berry weights when we underwater the plants and we don't wanna do that. So we wanna be able to, to, to detect what is the water status of the plants and make sure we're applying enough water to those plants. So what we also did is we took our thermal imaging camera and we measured each of these treatments in various plots in the field. So for example, on the right, you, um, you know, it's difficult to see the, the software does these calculations, but basically when we had no irrigation and on this particular date, the canopy temperature was 31.7 degrees Celsius. When we had full irrigation, we, uh, the canopy temperature was 30 degrees Celsius and 30% was in between. So now if we look at that relationship, we can see that the water status of plants as that declines, so the uh, canopy temperature increases. So with this information, what we're doing is we're, we're uh, developing a, what's called a crop water stress index that basically tells us how stressed the plants are based on the canopy temperature. So on the left is the crop water stress uh, index. So um, a blow up on the right, you can see with water deficits, how the canopy temperature is higher and the control that's well watered, the canopy temperature is bluer. And we could take this information and actually convert it to the water potentials or the water status of the plant. So the idea here is, you know, we're still working on this, but the idea is you'd be able to fly a drone in the field and know exactly what the water status of your plants are on a given day. So in summary, um, what we're learning is that we, we can use these drones in this remote imaging technology to fly fields and map them on a block by block basis to determine things like irrigation needs and, and nutrient uh, needs. Um, you can also use them for disease assessment. For example, we have a disease called, called um, shock virus um, um, where the plants will lose all their berries for the entire season. Well, we can assess how much of that shock virus is happening in the field using these drones. So we, can, so we can use this equipment to avoid water limitations and also optimize our irrigation use and energy use um, in our blueberry fields. And as I said, eventually what we're planning to do is to integrate this technology into a, a mobile irrigation app that's easy and accurate for growers to schedule their irrigation in their blueberry fields. So it looks like I'm out of time. Um, so I will stop there and ask, uh, are there any questions? Okay, David, thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, we have just one question um, related with, if you have uh, made an investigation about the uh, mechanical harvest of uh, blueberries, for uh, fresh fruit production. Uh, this is not the, uh, your temp, but uh, do you have any uh, information about that? Uh, uh, before I do that, um, I'm, I'm, ha I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember how to stop sharing here. Um, <laughs> usually I don't have to. Dejar de compartir pantalla. Maybe you could just stop my sharing and then that would solve the problem too. Yes, uh, wait a minute, please. Enrique is trying to do that from here. Okay, oh, so, so can you repeat the question? No, it, it's just a question about the, uh, if you have any information or, or have you uh, investigated about mechanical harvest, blueberry mechanical harvest and uh, for fresh fruit production? Okay, yes, we, um, we do have, I'm not doing it personally, but we do have a, a group of researchers that are now doing a lot of work on, on developing mechanical harvesters for fresh uh, market production. So what they, what they did is they actually developed these sensors that were the size of blueberries and they put them through the harvester and they also put them through the sorting machines to figure out where the impact or where the damage was happening that would, would you know, cause bruising in the fruit where it could not be used for fresh market. 
So they found like in the, in the harvester themselves, the, 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 the biggest problem is the catcher plates that catches the blueberries because those were hard plastic. So what they're developing are softer catcher plates that reduces bruising. So they're now working with harvester companies to develop these machines that can be used for fresh uh, market. Um, and um, I, I think what they've learned at this point, there are certain cultivars that we can use now for fresh, fresh market um, uh, harvesting, or using the machines for fresh market, um, but other cultivars we can't do that with. So things like, like Duke, for example, we can do that with, but, but cultivars like Liberty, we can't do that with yet. Okay. Here we have a question of uh, Freddy Salazar. He says, uh, why did you change the drone to a DJI? Was it better or something related with the wind speed? Yes, um, well, we started out with the, with the customized drone because we wanted to be able to modify it as much as possible. But the, but the, but the problem with that drone is it's, it wasn't as good as these, commercial, these, these um, drones that are available from larger commercial companies. So we found that you know, the, you know, the DJI, it's, it's just much more re robust it's easier to use. And as I showed, it has a much longer battery life. It'll last, you could fly almost an hour on a given battery um, and it's faster. So it can move through the field faster. So um, with regards to wind, you know, that's a good point. It, it is also useful on windy days. So in some areas we get very high winds. Um, so we can use the DJI drone um, in these fields on days that we couldn't use the ATI drone. Yes. Perfect. Uh, here I have another question from uh, Ingrid Castro. Hola, Ingrid, buen día. Uh, does the cloudy days, uh, rainy or wind, uh, affect the use of drones uh, for these uh, investigations? Yes, definitely. I mean, you're not going to want to use a drone on a, on, a, on a rainy day, for example, um, because obviously it's electronics, so, so that, that could, could ruin the drone. Um, windy days, you know, if it's too windy, you don't want to use a drone either. Um, but generally, you know, if, if you use it around uh, 12 o'clock noon time, um, it's not that windy yet where, where we are. So we can, if, so we could fly it in the morning or, or, or around midday, usually without any problems in most of our fields. Um, now the question is, is there a problem using cloudy days versus sunny days? And I will say that yes, you do get better images on a sunny day than on a cloudy day. Now you can you can adjust for the cloudy days, but if, if you're given a choice between a sunny and a cloudy day, I would definitely recommend flying on a sunny day. Okay, David. Um, I want to ask you something. Uh, years ago with uh, Abel, uh, Abel Gonzalez, uh, we worked with uh, 26 blueberry orchards uh, uh, in Southern Chile. And we saw that the range water use in the season fluctuated from 800 uh, cubic meters to over uh, 4,000 cubic meters. Uh, without use the technology like you show uh, in your presentation. Therefore, we saw that it was a great dispersion. Uh, so in this regard, with this technology, how much savings in water consumption have you achieved in blueberries yeah. while maintaining the productive levels? Yeah, um, well, I mean, in our experimental fields, we, we can save a considerable amount of water. Um, we are only just, you know, obviously we, we, we can, if we do what a grower does versus what we do, um, in some cases, we're gonna apply half or even half as much or even less than that than they apply. However, at other times of the year, what we find is that growers are actually under irrigating. So they over irrigate at certain times and under irrigate at other, other times. So at, at those times, we're actually finding that they're not applying enough water. So they're actually reducing production. So we're not working on, you know, trying to, to match exactly what the water requirements are throughout the course of the growing season. So that we're not only reducing irrigation water use. So, you know, I would guess that we could safe, safely say that we're gonna save anywhere from 10 to 20% um, over what a grower is doing but we're also gonna increase production by at least five or 10% by proper irrigation using this technology. Great. 
Uh, well, David, we know you woke up early today. Uh, you have uh, three less hours than us. Yeah. So uh, uh, thanks for your effort. <laughs> thanks, thank you for being with us today and uh, for sharing your experience and, and your knowledge. Um, uh, blueberry producers are, uh, many of them are already connected today. And uh, uh, we have more questions, but can we send it uh, to your email and you then yes, you answer please. that? Yes, please. I'd be happy to answer those questions. Yeah, via email. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was it was a it was a pleasure and an honor to speak to you today, and and uh, I hope you learned a little bit. Yes, we did. We have more than three hundred people connected uh, already. Okay. Listening. Good. Okay. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. Bueno, eh, agradecemos y, y felicitamos cierto, eh, a David por su presentación y, y a continuación proyectaremos el espacio publicitario de nuestros auspiciadores nuevamente cierto, con sus insumos y, y tecnologías eh, disponibles para regresar en los próximos cinco minutos.
BASF. We create chemistry.